Praise God. Amen. If we can ever get a hold of the reality, he will never let go of us. Never. But if there is a separation, it's because we've let go of him. But he is always extending his hand of grace and mercy and his love, and he will never, ever let us go. I don't know there are folks that say, you don't know where I've been, what I've done. I want to tell you that's not the issue. Amen. What we're talking about is the, un, the absolutely unconditional love of God. Amen. And uh, uh, I love saying it. I don't know that we really know just how much he loves us. Amen. But when we grasp it, a lot of things change in our lives. Amen. Yes. Praise God. The Easter season has come and some would say has gone. Oh no, it hasn't gone. <laughs> because resurrection marks a new beginning. A new beginning that invites us into an understanding of a divine calling and purpose in our life. There is reason for us to be followers of Christ. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing that he has done for us when we are touched by the hand of his love and grace that we want to turn and become the instrument of love and grace to other people. That's what it's all about. This has got to be something that is ongoing. Or I could say, to be quite honest with you, the resurrection, Calvary and resurrection would have been in vain if it would have stopped right there. But it didn't stop right there. The scripture tells us in Matthew 28, and I'll read some in just a moment, but you know the story. And the various gospels put the timeline of things in a way, I hope it's not confusing. I hope you study them close to see some of the landmarks, some of the places that Jesus said, I want to meet you in Galilee. I will go before you there as I had promised. The promise that he had made to them was not just at the resurrection. He'd made that promise before he was crucified. And he said, You'll, we'll see each other again. Jerusalem was kind of a, a, a safe place, a safe place a safe room for them, you might say, where they would meet in an upper room and they would uh, be together. So Jesus talked to his disciples after the resurrection and we see that there were several events that took place. But in Matthew 28, it takes us to the setting where they are now in Galilee. They have left for Galilee and Jesus is going to meet them there. If you will, in honor of the scripture, would you please stand with me this morning if you're able? And let's look to the word of God. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Could we say some of them were still doubting? And Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we have a job to do. May God add his blessing to our reading of his word. You can be seated. So let me put it this way. As I said a moment ago, the strength, I believe, of the gospel rests on three pillars that are very, very important. First of all, of course, is the death of Christ, the crucifixion. And then we would see the resurrection of Christ. But the third pillar that is very, very important is the great commission that Christ has given to all of us. So his death, his burial, and the Great Commission. And you can't take any one of those out of the equation and make it good news because we can tell the story of, but until we can say firsthand, I know what he has done for me through his death, burial, and resurrection, and now I can tell the story. Amen. I personally can tell others what he has done for me. How many of you have got a story to tell about the grace of God in your life and the beautiful miracle working power of God in your life that he is able to do far exceedingly above what we could ever ask or even imagine? That's good news. That's good news. And that's what we are called as the body of Christ to do. 
Now, there were at least five occasions, I say at least, I, I, I know five in the scripture, and I'll just leave it right there, where Jesus reiterated the Great Commission from the time of his first meeting with the disciples until he ascended, okay? And in that 40-day period, there's a lot of things going on, but there is this resounding message that is reiterated over and over again, and it is the assignment to the followers of Christ, that you are to go and make disciples. You're to go and share the story of the good news. You're to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and know that you have power with the Holy, from the Holy Spirit to accomplish the things that are far beyond what you can even imagine. Amen. Matter of fact, I would just say, if we were to attempt to do some of the things he has called us to do without the leading of the Holy Spirit, we would end up like the two disciples that went out and tried to cast out demons and came back and told Jesus, that guy just beat the daylights out of us. We laid hands on him and we were going to cast out the devil and look at us. Well, there are some things that come by, he said, by fasting and praying where we have to enter into that place of understanding. <laughs> here's the, you know what the understanding, this is not my message, but here's a message for you. My understanding of that portion of scripture when he sent out the 70 as he did and two came back and that was their report. I want to tell you my message, that, the message for me right there is don't get in the fight with the devil. Amen. You're victorious to begin with. So just speak to him in the name of Jesus and then let Jesus take care of it. But if, well, anyway, that's this. <clears throat> you can see I haven't preached in 90 days. <laughs> so this will sound different in the second service, I'm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> the last words of Jesus, I want to show it to you. Acts chapter one, and this is where Luke is saying the former treaties, the former things that have happened in the life of Jesus I have, my words, I have researched them, O Theophilus, and through the various credible witnesses and testimonies, I present now to you this, that after he was crucified and he was raised, he called his disciples together. Let me show you this. It's in verse six of chapter one of Acts. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept, and this is Luke's account that he is speaking of, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those things in time, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? I could add, why are you standing here staring into heaven? You've got an assignment. Go to it. <laughs> but here's what the angel said. Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. What a promise we have that he ascended on high so that he could come again. He ascended on high so he could give to us the Holy Spirit to be able to accomplish the things that he has asked us to do while we are here in this physical realm waiting for the reality of the greater promise that we will spend eternity with him. You know, I don't know if you remember or not some of those most significant words that somebody spoke to you in their, in their life at a specific time. Maybe it was in their passing. Maybe it was when they were leaving on a new assignment or a journey. Maybe it was a family member. Maybe it was somebody close to you. I remember when our oldest son, Stephen, was going uh, to college and, and we took him and helped him get all this stuff in his room. And, and then we, as we would do, we had a little prayer meeting in the parking lot. We kind of huddled together, Stephen, Christopher, and Cozy and I, and, and I prayed over, over him and, and we just committed him to the Lord. And, and then uh, we got in the car to leave and I was a basket case. I was crying while we were doing that. 
And I, we got in the car, started to drive off. And as we're driving off, I noticed Stephen was flagging me down. And so I, I stopped and rolled the window down. He came over. I had my arm on the window seal there. And he, he put his hand up. I'll never forget it up on my arm. And he looked at me and he said, Dad, are you going to be okay? <laughs> I lied to him. I said, sure, I'm going to be fine. <laughs> I was messed up. Isn't that funny? His last word to me in this new beginnings for him, in this new season of his life, I remember those words. I remember making a solo trip to Little Rock to see my father-in-law. Cozy and Vicky were by his side. He passed. He had stage four esophageal cancer. And it was, it was a cruel passing for him. Cozy and Vicky stayed by his side. And one day I, I drove to Little Rock and they were taking a little bit of a rest. And I, I went in to see Bart, Ezra Bartlett. Dignified man. Seeing him in that state was a tough thing. And uh, I loved my father-in-law. He gave me a good gift. Amen. And I reached over and I took his hand and I talked with him and he was not really able to communicate well. He could some, but not well. And I took his hand and we kind of fist locked together, you know, as guys will do. And I just held it and, and I prayed over Bart. I prayed over Bart. It was a beautiful moment. And I tried to release my hand and he wouldn't let go. And he reached up with his other hand and laid it on mine. I was kind of locked in place. And the most fluid conversation, words that I heard during that period of time came as my father-in-law turned the opportunity into blessing me. And he blessed me. I will never forget the last words that I heard from my father-in-law who I loved. It was a blessing, a blessing to me, a blessing over my family, a blessing over our ministry. It was a beautiful thing. Do you remember? Those la th these are the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. Amen. And it is a reiteration of what he had been saying to them in part before his death, but really straight to the point over 40 days, getting them prepared for the fact you, you've got a new beginning in front of you and you have a divine opportunity to fulfill a role in the kingdom of God and I'm depending on you to do this. I'm depending on you to do this. I think he's depending on us to show forth the love of Christ that we have experienced to others so that others may get to know him in his grace and his love as well. It's a beautiful thing that is taking place, we see, in the Word of God. You see, introducing people, some people would say, well, what does it mean to make disciples anyway? It's just literally introducing people to Jesus and sharing the good news and helping them know Him and follow Him. We don't just, we're not sniper uh, evangelists where we just run on the scene and, and we, we hand them a card, the, the four spiritual laws, and then run out the door. No, 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 no. We, we share the good news. And I want to tell you, it is good news. So, so let me just back up for just a second and say, if you haven't captured the full impact of it being good news, then don't go witness to anybody just yet. Just kind of wait a little bit until you get the essence of it and you understand the fact that he has loved us so much that he gave his life for us. And we have the privilege of sharing that good news with other people. Making disciples is more than a theological training. And it's, it's bigger than something that, that we might learn from, from conversation. It, it, it's a calling that all of us have been given by the Lord himself and then empowered by the Holy Spirit to go and share. So first and foremost, let me just say back up what I said a moment ago. This is Jesus' words in Luke chapter 10. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I love God. 
but I'm not too sure about my neighbor. But that's the test for us. Matter of fact, that's, that, that's probably the only test that we really need to pass in order to be able to go out and make disciples of others. Amen. Is that we love God with everything, but we also love our neighbor. Because he said everything that's been taught is wrapped up in this principle right here. Amen. Love God, love God, love God, and love others. Now we also see his divine call sometimes is setting people apart from where they are in life for a special assignment. We see that in the scripture. In Acts chapter 13, this is a beautiful portion of scripture. I love this. You'll see in verse two, one day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, these were the apostles, the the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for this special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. So what did they do when they left there? Just a little bit of the the history on that. They sailed to Cyprus and they first shared the gospel to the, the, the people, the Jewish people in the Jewish synagogue. And they are coming in and they are preaching the message that they had been preaching on this is what the law said and Christ came to fulfill the law. And here we are as living witnesses of his death, burial, his resurrection. And they are sharing the good news with them. That's a beautiful thing. And then the Holy Spirit led them to all of the cities in that that country, in that that region. And, And led them even into opportunities where miracles happened. I want to tell you, we've got to be ready for the fact that he may be walking you through the door where a miracle needs to take place. And you need to be the one who with boldness in the strong name of Jesus can say, I stand in with you by faith to believe for supernatural, divine intervention in your life, whatever it may be. But he also led them to those that were in authority, government officials, governors, matter of fact. And many doors were open to them. Why? Because they, they recognized that they had been set apart by the Holy Spirit for a specific task. Amen. Now some would say, well, I, I'm not qualified to do that. Well, I want to tell you we are all qualified as born again believers filled with his spirit to understand that we have been given an assignment wherever we are. If we're a school teacher, if we're an administrator in some capacity, if you're a a, a nurse, if you're a mechanic, I could go down the line, of course. Everywhere we are, Lord, lead me today to share the good news with somebody that is desperately in need of happiness, of joy being refreshed in their life. Let me be a word of wisdom and grace. Um, You see, I believe he speaks to us through his word. I believe he speaks to us through the gentle nudge of his spirit and through the collective witness of brothers and sisters in Christ. Over the past few weeks, there's been a lot of things that have happened and I don't have time to go into all that, but I'm telling you, we've, we've just, trying to learn how to relax has been a deal. It really has been a deal. And, uh, uh, thinking I was going to a party, but there was no party. Uh, dressed for it, you know, and then I realized, well, I could take my clothes off and go back to bed if I wanted to. <laughs> but I didn't want to do that. There are times, quiet times with the Lord. I so respect Cozy has always valued that time. I value that time. Where we hear the gentle nudges of the Holy Spirit. And there's some things that I just, I'm I'm not the journaler like a lot of people are, but I write a lot of things down that that come to my mind. And here's a few of those things this this period of time. So maybe this will resonate with you. Perhaps it will, perhaps it won't. But I'm learning that I can become distracted by other voices and miss hearing the still small voice of the Lord. I hear people say, you're not speaking to me anymore, Lord. (laughs) <laughs> he is, but there are other competing voices and sounds. 
And I'm learning that the spirit of the Lord will not scream at me. So I've got to position myself to be still and know. Be still and hear. And then I'm also learning that Jesus will not be crammed down anybody's throat. Is that okay for me to say? That backfires on us, folks. It really backfires on us. You remember your little kids when you try to get them to eat broccoli and they're just, oh, oh, oh. That's the way some folks are when we're trying to give them Jesus the way we do. He doesn't want to be crammed down anybody. As a matter of fact, he will not be crammed down anybody's throat. But he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, those that are ready. And can I tell you, he will never lead you to witness to someone that he has not already prepared for that witness. He's got them ready for you, wherever it may be. And then I, I'm, I'm learning also that if I truly desire to know the assignment that he has for my life, I must prepare my heart to hear what he is saying to me. I must prepare my heart. So there are some that are in perhaps a season of waiting, trying to discover, God, what is it you want me to do other than maybe what you're, oh, where you are. Find the joy in where you are. But if there's that nudging, there's that stirring, there's that reoccurring dream, for he speaks to us in dreams and visions and, and that you can't get away from, find that place where you're praying and, and saying to the Lord, I, I, I hear and now I desire to know. And I believe he will. You know, <clears throat> I, I'm running a risk here by offending somebody by overlooking, but I want to run through some names here at CLC that you know, that you recognize. And this is not a review of 40 years because there are many people that it would, it, I, I couldn't put on this that would take time that have gone to other places that fulfill ministries, but names and things that are right here in front of us, I just want to bring this to your attention. I, I want to say something about Henry and Cindy Lohman that are sitting right back here. Mercy International. You guys stand up. Let everybody see who I'm talking about. Henry and Cindy Lohman. Love you guys. Bless you. Just as I recognize I'm in a new season of my life, a lot of our conversation has been with them. They recognize a new season in their life and changes and things that have to take place in order to accommodate the ongoing ministry that God has anointed and gifted them to do. Amen. God called them to Honduras. Uh, Yama Mangila, is that close enough? Forgive me if it's not. In Honduras. And I want to tell you, while there they have planted churches, they've planted 20 churches, they've built over 200 homes because when they got there, the hurricane happened. And some would say, oh, when we were just ready to start our ministry, the hurricane happened. And the Holy Spirit said, you're here on time. Here's what I want you to do. They found favor with the government. They were able to build homes. And as a result, over these many years that they have served there, God has done some great things. They have put over a thousand, helped over a thousand young people complete, go through and complete high school, which is a marvelous thing. And then Henry one day sees a people group that have been forgotten. Matter of fact, the government would refer to them as the lost and forgotten. And you travel up in the mountains. I didn't make that trip because I look at a donkey and I think, this is not for me, this is for someone else. <laughs> and they would travel into the mountain and there where there's 80,000 people, they begin to minister. And today there are eight churches that have been planted up there and there are ministries that are thriving in what was an unreached people group of the world. Can you say thank God for that? <laughs> then let's move on forward. Dean Lohman, not here today, Dean and Melissa. Uh, Dean is Henry's brother, introduced to that part of the world through Henry. 
and he has a different assignment on his life, and it's, he's setting up medical clinics. He's had, setting up dental clinics. He's setting up all these things. He's taking the big trailers here and fixing them and sending them. Can I just tell you something that's beautiful? He has found favor with one branch of the government. I'm not sure that I, I can tell all of it, but one branch of the government that says, if you will load the trailer, these big semi-trailers you see, if you'll load it and get it to the dock, we will take it anywhere you want us to take it. And there are medical clinics that are set up. There are, there are housings that are set up in different ways. He has done a marvelous job. Matter of fact, there was one, he called me, he said, pastor, he said, it's setting on the dock. It's setting on the dock. It's ready to go medical. It's fully equipped, ready to go. All they got to do is set it up and I can't get it. I can't get it into, he was wanting to take it into Romania and it's just not going to happen. It doesn't look like it is. And he said, but then I get this. So we were praying about it. Then he calls and he says, I've got a phone call today. And he said, they asked for permission. Can we take this to, uh, uh, where, where was it that he went from there? Uh, where? Ukraine. Yes to the Ukraine because they are desperately in need. And that was moved to a strategic location as a triage center, you would say, in Ukraine. And it was set on that dock and he was worried, where's it gonna go? What can I do? And they called and said, we'll get it there. Would you give us permission to take it there? It's unbelievable the things that have happened. Dean and Melissa Lohman. And then Monty and Kimberly Henderson, you know of them, our, our pastors from here that went to South, uh, uh, South Africa and Cape Town and planted the church. And they are doing what ministers that I have sat at the table with said could not be done. And they are raising up a very diverse community that is exemplifying what it means to love your neighbor and to care for one another. It's a beautiful thing. Eight years now, is it? Eight years that they've been doing it. And that's where Pastor Grant and Afsana went and worked for three years before the Holy Spirit called them home to us. But they were able to be exposed to the epicenter of, of, of racial intolerance and all of these things. So you look through a new lens. Everything is an opportunity for a new beginning into a divine place that God is calling all of us to. I believe that. And Sue Whiteley, stand up back there, dear. Sue Whiteley, I love this dear lady. God called her. God called her to Romania. She and Bob went to South Africa, thought that's where they were going to be while they were there. They wrote a lot of materials and got things ready. And then God spoke to them and go to Romania. That's where Bob passed away. He died of a massive heart attack one evening in Romania. But Sue has continued to come and go. And matter of fact, the gypsies there that she has touched, the, the lives that have and working, and she works close with other organizations that are getting things done. Matter of fact, David and Kelly Krauss, are they in this service? They're not in this service. They'll be in the next one probably. David and Kelly Krauss have come alongside and now in this new season of Sue's life where she's not journeying there near as much, but yet she has the credibility there with people in high places. She is saying, here, look what God has done. Let's move forward with this thing. David and Kelly are serving in that capacity. Bob and Myrna, would you guys stand up? Bob and Myrna Klimple. I love these guys. Thank you for all that you do. They've been in Africa. They've been in Mexico. They've been in the Dominican Republic. And Bob, as you know, is a master builder. He has built churches and housing for pastors over the years. And Myrna is a fabulous teacher. And she has been teaching in those environments and her musical skills and everything. And every year, how many, 20 years or better, you guys, something like this, I've been doing every summer for at least a month, they have gone over and they have served in one of these countries like this. And, and, and really, in this season of their life, working just enough to raise the money to go and do it again. And I say thank you for what you have done. But the nudging of the Holy Spirit is what leads us all to the place. What am I going to do? Where does God want me to be? Not in this service. I don't see Dr. Simeon Heinze and Stephanie, his wife, 
but he was one of the assistant coaches at the University of Arkansas and, and a graduate, played basketball at JBU, and God has stirred his heart, and he has an organization called IES. It's about education and sports, and it's about going back to his homeland in the Bahamas where they are doing things as we speak, creating opportunities, and in that community of education and sports, it's giving new life to a lot of young people who are just sitting on the curb without opportunities. I just think that's a beautiful thing. It's a new beginning for him and and a divine opportunity that God has called him to. I could go on and on, and I'll, I'll just stop right there. I have to say, no, 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 I won't. I won't stop. Life source. Life source. I thank God for the day. Ernie Condiff walked in my office and he said, this is what my heart says to do. And we were able to partner with him. And in this season of transition, he has turned it over to Jimmy who is doing a fabulous job. And life source is flourishing. And then Compassion House. What a beautiful thing it was just recently to go out, Renee. Stand up, Renee Carr, back here. And participate in the dedication services for Renee's house. Compassion House keeps growing. Jennifer Hogg is doing an incredible job. It's just beautiful. And then recently, Jim Estes in our church brought to Pastor Grant and I the attention of the ministry of Kairos, prison ministry. And and we see the value of it. And we see the fire burning in him to do this. And so pastor wants us to take that to another level of influence and opportunity. I could talk all day about these things, but I guess personally I could say, I remember when I was 15 years old, that there was a nudging of the Holy Spirit. Would you be willing to do what I ask you to do? Lord, what does that mean? Just be willing to go. Just be willing to say, Just be willing to follow me. And I've never regretted one moment of the decision I made that day. And the Holy Spirit set me apart from the other things that I might want to get in line with so that I would stay focused on a divine sense of calling. It may be to your family, it may be to your friends. It may be to the region. It may be to the world. But it is an opportunity. And resurrection is a new beginning for all of us to discover our divine call in the Great Commission. What do we do with what we have received? Bow your heads with me, please, everybody. I've taken liberty time-wise this morning. This has been on my heart pastor gave me the liberty to speak my heart today. I want to offer to some of you an invitation to allow God to speak into your heart. Allow God to nudge you with the Holy Spirit and and prompt you toward something that he has for you. It's not a time for us to condemn ourselves and say, I am not worthy of, I cannot, and Lord, I should have. No, it's a new beginning because of resurrection and it's an opportunity for a divine call. I would want you to go to the job tomorrow with a new understanding that I am here for a purpose. I'm not cramming Jesus down anybody's throat, but I'm gonna love people like Jesus loved them. I'm going to be sensitive to what he says. Or maybe he wakes you up in the middle of the night and puts something on your heart you've only dreamed about. I encourage you to take another step toward it. Investigate it. Pray about it. Come talk with Pastor Grant and, or myself. And, and we've been there. We've experienced this. We, we, we know that nudging. And, and the body of Christ will rally around and help you fulfill whatever it is that God is calling you to do. So Lord Jesus, we've presented your word. I know that I fall short of 
doing justice to this beautiful, beautiful reality that you have called all of us into now to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Quicken to our hearts what you would have us do. And when we come to the table of the Lord this morning, Father, may there be a prayer of willingness on our lips where we'd say, I will. I will. Lead me. Guide me. I will. In the precious name of Jesus, we give thanks. Amen.